Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, so my name is Julie Faith Van Balzer, and this is Book Club. Yay. So welcome. I see that Lisa's in the comment saying that this is so fun. Favorite combo, art and books. It's a very fine combo. I have to say if I don't say so myself. And I do also want to welcome, I saw that we have a new member today. So thank you so much, Mary Beth, for becoming a YouTube channel member. I appreciate it. Okay, so a couple quick things just as an introduction. Um, if you want to learn more about what I offer in terms of classes and coaching and all sorts of freebies, lots of stuff, you can check that out at juliebalzer.com. Um, you can sign up for my free Friday newsletter very easily and quickly if you want to get an update every Friday about what's going on. And I see we've got at least one thumbs up on Facebook, so I always appreciate that too. So thanks so much. Um, and you can, of course, take an art class with me at balzerdesigns.com. Okay, so enough business. Let's get onto the book. Feel free to leave your comments. I always like to know what you think. I'm wondering how many people here have read the book. I know some books are more popular than other books. So I think this one might be popular because I think watercolor is very, you know, popular. So hey, Carol. Hey, Jana. Thanks for saying hi in the comments. Okay, so this is it watercolors for everyone. You can see that my copy is a library book. I take out a lot of art books in the library, which really helps me decide whether I want to add it into my catalog of books that I own. I think it's actually kind of a big decision, you know, what you actually want to bring in. So Kim says that she has ordered it, but not read it. I often get into that boat. In fact, I get into the on my bookshelf, but not read it all the time, which is one of the reasons I started book club because I do that all the time. Um, Mary Beth said that she read half of it. We've got another half of it, half of the exercises. I mean, I think that's great. I think that's great to have done it. Um, haven't read it, checking out what to see, what I have to say about it. And uh, Laura says, sort of somewhat similar, didn't read, but may, depending on what I say about it. Ooh, pressure. Okay, and Kim's a librarian, so she appreciates the library books. That's great, you guys. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna say. I really enjoy this book. I think it's, um, there are a lot of the philosophical things about it that I really, really um, agree with. It got a little bit la la foofy kind of for me. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it, it's it's a little like you're a hol holistic spirit kind of thing. And it, that is awesome for people who are super into it. It, I find it slightly off-putting, but I think that's totally one of the reasons that art is, you know, what anybody wants to do. The thing that I really like about this book is I think um, one of the things she says in the beginning, which we will get into, is that she says really, that, you know, this isn't a book where you have to like do the exercise in order and she's teaching you all the usual skills you usually see in watercolor books. Like first we learn to do a wash, then we learn wet and wet and dry and wet and all that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? But what she's actually doing is she's just trying to get you to like loosen up and let all sorts of things kind of mix together. So that's great, right? Okay, so I have obviously marked a couple pages that I want to share that I think are important. Some of, so up at the beginning, there's a lot of kind of philosophical. I'm gonna put my um, desk view, hopefully I'm gonna put my desk view up on there. Um, let's see if it wants to cooperate or not. I've been having a little bit of trouble with my connection. So let me try to, well, you can see my face is blocked by my phone. If not, I have another overhead device that I can use, but I'm hoping to get this one working would be very nice. Technology is great until it doesn't work. You know what I mean? And then it's terrible and upsetting, but maybe it will work now. Let's see, it was working five minutes ago. Okay, there you go. If it goes out, you'll let me know, but here we go. So this is the book. Watercolor is for everyone. And so a couple things about it. I have my first page flag here because I really love what she says here at the beginning. Um, so she says, mostly it's a way to teach watercolor painting to those who have a desire to create, but who don't think they can learn how. Almost immediately, a woman in the rain in the room raised her hand. That's me, she said. There was some laughter, but also a lot of nodding and affirmation. It was then that I really understood that most people will never commit to a long course of study to be a watercolor painter. But that doesn't mean that they cannot enjoy a meaningful creative practice with brush, 
paints, and paper. And on that day, watercolor for everyone was born. Now, I think that this is so key because an enormous number of people come to my classes and tell me that they're not creative, which I always find is hilarious because I'm like, hello, you're in an art class. Being creative is about having the creative spirit. It's not about being Michelangelo, you know? And I think that that's really important to remember. And I so I really like her attitude. Um, and this is the other thing she says a lot in the book. And so it's a big philosophy point that I want to make sure that I hit home, which is she says intuitive process based watercolor. It means that we create from a place of no expectations of how our finished artwork will look instead of planning out our work, which can increase our perception of failure. If it doesn't turn out as we expected, we operate from a safe place of simply appreciating a moment in time by playing with colorful paints, a beautiful brush and lovely textured paper. I think that is like my own personal philosophy in many ways. It kind of wanders into um, sort of deeper, more like spiritual stuff as it gets on. But like that basic tenet of like, let's have no expectations. Let's not fear failure. I 100% am excited about. And I love that she carries it through the whole book. Um, I see that Ellen says, me too. That's just not what I'm into, that intuitive juju stuff. But great exercises looking at getting used to what your watercolors can do. And I have to totally agree. Okay. So, oh, my overhead camera has decided to be funky. Okay, so the next, oops, page flag, I'm just gonna rip out. So this is where, when I'm talking about, and you're like, Julie, what do you mean by all of that? Okay, so the first thing she talks about is honoring and appreciating this moment in time and your tools and materials. And I think, you know, one of the things I like is that all of the supplies in this are really simple. Um, and she says, you know, matter your budget, there are beautiful tools waiting for you. And she really talks about how to choose tools. And I think that's a common question that many people have, how to choose the best tools. And the magical thing is she says, everything can be done with one brush. Everything exercise in this book can be done with one brush, which is great. And she says, if you're going to spend the money, don't try to buy like a really expensive sable haired brush, but maybe go for really nice paper. So I have to tell you, my original plan was just to do all these exercises in my regular like sketchbook. This is mixed media paper. It takes a beating. I use it for all sorts of stuff. But because she said that, I ended up um, digging into my stash of 100% cotton, like the really nice stuff, Arches um, watercolor paper, and I ripped it down. You can see the tear lines and did some smaller pieces. And I did all the exercises in here. And I actually discovered that she was 100% right about the paper. So I'll show you all this stuff, but I'm just going to show you really quickly where I discovered she was right. So these color samples were done on the mixed media paper. Okay. And this is the same paint, but on the 100%, oh, camera, come on. But on the 100% um, cotton paper. So... I'm gonna see if unplugging and replugging helps me here. I apologize for the technical difficulties. So you can see what a difference it is. Here it is again on that 100% cotton paper. And here it is on the mixed media paper. It's spectacularly different. This also took like 10 times longer to dry. And I was like, oh, I'm such an idiot. Of course, paper matters, and especially in watercolor. So yeah, a lot of people are saying it. Mary Beth is saying it. Paper quality is a complete game changer in watercolor. And it really, really is. So that's a great takeaway from this book already. Worth the price of admission since I paid nothing to get it out from the library. Uh, OK, so now. Um, this I thought was really interesting. She says, if you want to get started as a minimalist, the best choice is a split primary palette, meaning a warm and cool version of the three primaries, red, blue, and yellow. So she has a picture of a palette where she's done that. If you don't want to buy a lot of paints, this is the palette that she recommends. So can you see that it's warm and cool, red, yellow, and blue? And that's considered a split primary palette. And this is enough to really get you started with doing almost everything. Although I have to say she adds metallic watercolor to almost everything, which I find really interesting. And I also was kind of like, I know that I want to add metallic watercolor to everything, but I got a little convinced occasionally when it, that sparkle really made a difference. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was one of the care things that she says here, and she does go over a lot of important care information is she says, once you've selected your watercolor paints, always leave your set open to air dry after every use. 
you guys, I am so guilty of closing up my box and not leaving it open. So I feel like when experts tell you things like use better paper and leave your box open, I'm listening. So I've been leaving my box open and I'm going to see if it makes a difference. Now, usually the reason they say that is because your watercolors actually can get moldy. I do know that. It's actually one of the reasons I have this palette. This is a Magello palette. And one of the things about it is it's supposed to have uh, make there be no mold so that I can just close it. It's called an airtight leak proof palette. Um, and so I love this thing because I have never gotten mold in it, but I do also have some other watercolors that, oops, that are not in that kind of palette. And so I do want to make sure that I am absolutely going to leave those open because I want them to air dry. So that's my plan for the future is to be a better person about that. She also gives all the tips that I totally miss about never leaving your jar I mean, never leaving your jar, never leaving your paintbrush in a jar of water because it ruins the tip. And you can probably tell I've left this paintbrush in a jar of water a couple times. So the tip is pretty ruined. So do what I say and what she says, not what I do. OK, next flag. Um, I also really like this philosophy. It's something I agree with 100%. Look at some of the beautiful student work that she showcases in the book. And she showcases a lot of student work throughout, which I find very encouraging. Because sometimes you look at what the teacher does or the instructor, the author does, and you think, well, I'm never going to be able to do that, right? But when you see student work, I think sometimes it makes you think, oh, what she's teaching is accessible to a lot of people. And there are a number of different ways to interpret the same idea, right? These are very different pieces. And I think that's great too. So she says here, one thing we must be aware of is our inner critic. Oh my gosh, mine is loud. As a teacher, I see many students make critical statements about their works. And I gently remind them that it's just one day among many days, one lesson among many lessons, we can choose to see our paintings with fresh childlike eyes of wonder or with the harsh eyes of our inner critic. And I choose to see with wonder and I hope the same for you. So there are so many things I love about that sentence, but one of them that I really, really like is that sh that idea of I can choose to look at it with wonder or I can choose to look at it like a critic. So that really is a choice. I know sometimes it doesn't feel like a choice because that inner critic is strong and comes yelling at you, but you do have the choice to tell it to sit down and shut up and get out of your way. And I think that's so key. So I just... I really, I, I heart her philosophy big time about all that stuff. Okay, so the lessons in the book are really interesting. So they're laid out in such a way that you don't have to do them in order. And it says the instructions are not step by step as you might find in other books about watercolor, but they're introduced by philosophies and thoughts to help you open your head, hands, and heart to exciting new possibilities. And this is where it drifts a little into foo-foo la la for me. It's not that I don't agree with her 100%. I do. It's just... Sometimes some of that stuff makes me a little whatever. But anyway. Okay. So. Um, and then this is about not letting the brush uh, sit in water. It's a whole section on it that I just flagged for myself to say, like, Julie, please go ahead and, you know, do that. So then the rest of the book, um, one of the interesting opening exercises is she talks about designing a chop, um, which Let's see if I can put this back in, which is a way of signing your work. And so I actually, since I have a lot of stamp carving experience, I did do that exercise and I did design my own stamp um, to sort of sign my work with. So you can see I sketched, 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 just sketched. And here is the stamp that I came up with and I stamped it on some work. There you go. And I stamped it on this piece in the corner. So she recommends to use stamping ink. I actually used watercolor to stamp it because I thought, why not? This is watercolor, right? So that's kind of cool. Um, and then the rest of the book is just really exercises. And you can see that what she does is she has the pictures, A, B, C, D, and then she also has the written instructions. So you can sort of follow both to figure it out. Um, I thought I would show you what I did and then my favorite of the exercises um, so here is, are the exercises that I ended up taking advantage of. So, um, obviously I made the stamp, 
You can see it took a lot of different thinking about it to get to this one. Um, and then this was really interesting. So this is apparently from Zen Buddhism called Enso. And it's the idea of drawing like a perfect ring with like, I'm trying to get the metallic watercolor to sparkle here for you. Um, but it's the idea of drawing like a perfect ring uh, with a bold stroke. And I did these interlocking rings, which was suggested in the book. This is towards the end. And I also always like the exercises towards the end. That's a personal peccadillo of my own. But um, here you go. So these are the instructions on the ENSO. And it says that ENSO is a practice of creating a circle with one or two uninhibited brush strokes of ink to express a moment when the mind is free to allow the body to create. And so here are some examples. I really like these interlocking ones. So I decided I wanted to try that. And so that's where this one came from. Um, this is the first real like watercolor exercise in the book, which is really just about letting sort of colors mix together and getting comfortable with everything. Um, and, you know, I liked, by the way, this is just a good sketchbook habit. I like to write my thoughts and reactions to things. I did write like Arches Paper, Number 8 Brush, Core Watercolor, plus Rembrandt Sparkle. You know, what are the supplies that I used? And then I say like where I changed the instructions. And I even said this exercise was kind of math for me, just not sure what the learning is or if the result is anything special. That said, I've used watercolor before. So maybe that was not the right exercise for me, but I kept going. I even wrote here, I thought this was going to be stupid, but I actually enjoyed it. I even like the sparkles, although it suffers from the same thing that all of my watercolors do, which is overworking. One of the things I've learned about watercolor from doing it over the years is that, you know, you have to kind of let some things go and leave some like white space. But, uh, you know, I am not good at that always. Oh, and here you can see that I used my custom stamp again. I stamped this with watercolor. You could also, of course, use stamping ink. I just really like stamping with watercolor. Um, this page I already showed you. This was this was about combining um, indigo and rust, so meaning blue and kind of an orange color to see how they mix and create all these beautiful other colors. So what I did here, just out of curiosity, was I wanted to see what would happen with different colors. So this is all. Um, the same ultramarine blue, but then I did raw sienna, transparent red oxide, Van Dyke brown, and Venetian red to see if the mixture was different. And the fact is on the mixed media paper, it all looks pretty similar. I think it would probably be different here. Um, I do want to remind you that um, my sketchbook is not meant to be pretty. And I think sometimes people see things on the internet and think it's supposed to be pretty, but this is just like notes to myself things, you know, thoughts I'm thinking. I wrote here, you can see the sparkles a lot more when the paint is dry. Just things I want to remember so that I can look back. And especially with a library book, something that you're going to be returning to the library and won't have access to, I think it's really important to write down your learning so that you can really think about it when you look back at it the next time. So this was an interesting, except for this circle, this was a series of exercises that was about finding inspiration. And I think we're all looking for how to find inspiration. By the way, thank you, Bonnie, for agreeing with me that it's important to write in your sketchbook. You know, I think it's important. OK, so this had you had to be inspired by a poem. So I took one of my favorite E.E. E. Cummings poems and I just lettered it with watercolor. This is a trick I used to do all the time when I was super into watercolor several years ago. Um, inspired by artwork, I actually just looked up some abstract artwork on Pinterest that I had pinned and I went ahead and, um, you know, just sort of played around with how to try to get uh, the lines that somebody was doing with like a pen and paint and all sorts of stuff, but in watercolor, like, can you translate that? So that was fun. Um, and oh, hey, Jenna, thanks so much for uh, giving the super sticker. I appreciate that a lot. Okay, this one was inspired by nature. So I just grabbed a leaf and went ahead and, you know, did a, like a sort of representational painting of the leaf. One of the things that is always so beautiful about watercolor is just how everything blends and bleeds. And I just, it's so beautiful. This was one that I rolled my eyes at, but ended up loving, which is she suggested that you um, pull a tarot card. And I do own a tarot deck. So maybe I am a little la la foo foo, right? 
but and I ended up pulling the three of wands, which basically looks like sort of three poles with a guy's back. Uh, it could be a woman, but I think it's a man a back in a long cloak. And so I sort of was like, how am I going to interpret this into watercolor? And so it became these like sticks sort of linked together to create the three of us, me, my partner and our little boy. Um, and then this was inspired by music. I just put on some music. It happened to be Nocturne number 20 in C sharp minor. And this is sort of what came out from that music. I don't think that any of these are like brilliant art, but they were a good way to get rolling and get my brain thinking. This exercise I loved, which I did even say, you can see I said here, 100% loved this exercise. So this exercise was about taking complementary colors. Those are colors that are across the color wheel from each other. So I used a hot pink and then some teal and some blue, and I think a little bit of orange in here too. And what I did is I just let them, you let them bleed into each other and you see what you get. And she has in here um, some beautiful examples of where she has done this. Here you can see the exercise of just filling in the circles. This is all student work. So you can see depending how much water you use, this one is very bleedy because there's a lot more water involved. So things are flowing together as opposed to if you're more controlled. So watercolor can be flexible, do you know what I mean, based on sort of how you use it. But that was definitely um, one of my faves. And I'm going to definitely do this again because I just loved that. OK, really fun. Um, so this was an interesting exercise. So she this is this is where I started to have a problem. So she suggests that you create. Oh, by the way, this so this is um, our sacred tools and the monogram. And she really talks about like her philosophy of like she lights a candle and like really has a whole ritual around it. Um, this was a exercise that was about creating an angel. Here you go. Angels among us. And you know, I think angels aren't just not my personal thing, which is fine. We don't all have to be the same, right? And um, there are some really cute angels that other people created. Super cute. And so I sort of tried the exercise. I didn't end up putting the wings on, but I was trying to find out what was interesting about it to me. And I think this is the key if you take anything away, which is someone doesn't have to be like your spirit animal or completely agree with you or like 100% even be on your wavelength. I think the thing that you're always trying to do is to figure out how to take whatever you're being taught and make it work for you. And so I was like, okay, what am I liking about this? Well, I liked that she said to use more watery color. So it was not quite as bright. If you look at like this, these are harsh, bright colors. This is very soft and lovely. It's the same exact paints. I'm just using more water and maybe adding a little bit of brown into it. Right. And I was like, the other thing I like is drawing this sort of simple shape and then filling in the different sections. That's something I've done forever just with acrylic. So I really like the idea of doing it with watercolor. So I took her exercise and I made it work for me. This is my own version made up for my brain of just like how to take her exercise and make it work for me, which is instead what I did is I filled the entire page. You can see my pencil lines with sort of a pencil line tangle and then I used again those soft shapes to kind of fill it in. And for me personally, this works for me. This is exciting. This is something that I want to do again. So this is pretty exciting. Um, so Jenna says, I hope your camera's not dying. Unfortunately, I think it's my laptop that's dying. The USB ports keep um, failing. And so that's actually, I just keep plugging and unplugging the USB cord. I sadly think I'm gonna have to buy a new laptop but I'm holding off as long as humanly possible. But yeah, that's sorry. I apologize for the technical stuff. Um, and Mary Beth says, I'm all about the rituals, but making is always kind of the hot mess <laughs> express bus, no ritual. Yeah, and I think like everybody's different. Some people that would feel not great for them and some people that feels perfect. And that's the whole idea of kind of the ritual, you know, which I really like. And Ellen, I agree with you totally. Ellen says, even though I'm not so juju, I think this book has a lot to offer and I'm overall very pleased with it. I think it has something in it for everyone. I agree. I think this has a lot of philosophy that I 100% agree with. And the parts that you don't like, you can kind of just 
you know, skip over. Just like Tani said here, where she said she couldn't do the angel and so she moved on. That's exactly right. And Kim says that she thinks she'll like it. So that's perfect. See, there's something for everyone. Watercolor is for everyone. You just kind of have to make it work for you. Okay. Here on this side, this exercise didn't work for me. I, I think I had to run down to the kitchen to get salt. So I had already put the wet watercolor on and I think it dried too fast. So the salt didn't really work. So what I ended up doing is I did this landscape exercise and I ended up throwing the salt into that. And here what the salt does is you can see it creates these sort of like little voids and pockets that I think look like really great texture in a landscape. So that this is another example of make it work for you. Art is not one size fits all. Nobody is right and has the correct way of doing it. How you like to do it and what makes you feel happy and comfortable is correct. So I didn't get it on that first try. So I ended up making it work, you know, on a different exercise. And I love the way that it added the texture to this kind of beach drawing. One thing that she does say in the book that I wanted to point out, because I think it's so smart and so true. Here you go. Um, and she says, I always tell my students that it usually takes three tries to really learn something. The first time we are learning, the second time we are practicing what we have learned, and the third time we are comfortable enough to relax and really let the paint flow. Your first landscape is a great place to begin the rule of three tries. My guess is that they will all have their own unique beauty and you will have a couple to send out in the mail. So this is the exercise that I ended up doing here. And here are some examples from her students. Wow. So everybody's is so different. All of these are three color landscapes, which is really, really cool. So... Um, anyway, I thought this was a really fun idea. And again, the idea of three tries. So like this was my first try. This was my second try, even though they're not the exact same exercise. My first try using salt on this one, my second try using salt on this one. And then I also used a coarse salt, um, Ellen, by the way, um, I, I used him pink Himalayan sea salt, but yes, because they're the bigger chunks do a little bit better. Um, okay. So Sherry says, it looks like an interesting book. May have to get it from the library. And, uh, yeah, I love talking about books. By the way, if you have any suggestions for a book you'd like to see me cover doing during, um, one of these book clubs, please let me know. Cause I'm always searching around for what would be a good book. I love books. Um, and Jana asks, is this book new? What is the published date? So did I already pass the did I already pass the page where they tell you the publishing date? Hmm. Interesting question. Oh, here we go. Uh, it's 2020. So yeah, came out. Um, it's a pandemic book. Okay. So this is some of my favorite exercises. This is my number one favorite. And I'm going to do this one with you because I love it. And I'm going to do it 1 million more times. Um, this was a feather exercise, which was fun. And you should see some of the feathers in here. They're just jaw droppingly gorgeous. Let's see if I can't find some of those feathers for you in here. Uh, 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 feather, 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 please. Here you go. So these are some of the beautiful feathers. Look at this is student work. Just so lovely. So lovely done in watercolor. They're absolutely fabulous. Um, and this is a flower exercise. And I loved making these flowers. I am going to do these flowers 1,000 more times. I want to try doing these flowers with acrylic and not just watercolor. I love the way that she teaches how to do these. It's so simple and the results are so beautiful. I am, I'm into these. Maybe they're pansies. I'm 100% into them. So I really, really like them. Okay. So this exercise is called um, Ancient Song. And what it's about is you take the form of a ballad. So, so I don't know if you're, you know this, but in poetry, we talk about like, there's an A, B, A, B, 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 A, and that's like the rhyming scheme. So a technically uh, a ballad is A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, A, C, D. And what she says is assign a color to the A, B, and the C. 
Okay. So I think I did blue and then this kind of rust color and then this green. And that was my ABC. And then D is going to be a metallic. Okay. Which I added in here. I don't know if you can see the gold. Let's see if I can't get that to shine a little bit. Maybe gold watercolor me. Oh, maybe a little bit. You're getting that flash in there looking pretty good. Um, so anyway, so the idea is that you do it in the order of this song. And I think it is just so simple and yet so cool. So I thought we could do it. So one of the things to know is a lot of the exercises in this book start with the idea of taping your watercolor down to a board. And this, of course, is if you've ever, you know, put something very wet on your paper, you may have noticed that, of course, it, um, I'm just going to tape it over here so I have room for my palette. It uh, starts to buckle. And that's because the water on the surface is causing it to buckle. So if you tape it to a board, then it doesn't do that. I'm taping it to this cutting mat because that's what I have around. And it makes it really easy. But, you know, you could certainly just have, I think traditionally it's more like a large piece of masonite or something like that. Um, but I'm just going to, you want to tape to something that's not going to buckle itself. So that's why I like masonite as opposed to like cardboard or something like that. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put it on here. So Teresa says it was so reasonable. I bought it. I'm just getting started with watercolor. You know what I'm going to tell you? Buy books. I absolutely think that you should buy books. I happen to need a new computer and be doing a home renovation, which is why I'm not buying books. But 100% yes, buy the book because you're supporting someone who's really sharing an enormous philosophy with you. And as Sherry says, it's only $14 on Amazon. So I'm a huge fan of buying books, by the way. I just I just can't right now. Okay. Um, and Sherry says, one of the tricks from Frugal Crafters that you put water on the back of the card as well as the front and it won't warp. Yes, because it equalizes it. So you can do that instead of taping it too. Okay, so now um, we're going to go ahead and do our order here. So it's A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, A, C, D. And I'm going to open up my watercolors. I'm using core watercolors, Q, O, R. They're from Golden. And I like to just use a spray spritz bottle to kind of just activate everything and get everything kind of wet and oozy just to start with. But you certainly don't have to. That's just a personal taste kind of thing. Um, the thing about core watercolors, and you've probably heard me say this before, that makes them different from other watercolors is so all watercolors are three things, pigment, binder, and water, right? And so the thing is, core watercolors, the binder that they're made with is not gum Arabic, which is in most watercolors. Instead, um, they use something called aquaphor, and aquaphor is 100% clear. Gum Arabic has a yellowish tint. So what it means is all watercolors have a slightly yellowish tint, as opposed to the core watercolors, which have absolutely no tint to them. So if you care, there's that. It's kind of like really good wine. I can't really tell the difference, but I believe it. OK, I just like them because I think the color pigmentation is crazy intense, just like regular golden paints. OK, so for our A, let's use hot pink because we can. So I'm going to do my A line, which is just not enough water, which is just a, you know, sort of fun, broad line across the top. There we go. That's my A line. Then for our B. Let's do, let's do this kind of orange color here for our B. And then, so the deal is you want to sort of touch in some places and not touch in other places, but the line is just sort of traveling across. And then it's back to A, back to A, back to A. Touch in some places and not in other places. There we go. And then it's going to be BB. So I'm going to do B. I think maybe you have to sing while you're doing it. B. No, you don't. Just because it's called Ancient Song doesn't mean you have to sing. Just kidding. Won't, won't make you 
have to do that. Um, so then I'm going to come across with another B. The hardest part is remembering what color I was using previously. Uh, and then it goes to C. So I think for my C color, I'm going to go for this sort of indigo color because I can't stop. I love blue. And the idea is you just keep doing kind of a, sh I don't want to call it a shaky line, but a sort of interesting up down kind of line. And then it goes B again. So here's my B color. And this is really about how, you know, these wet colors are touching each other. What I like about this exercise is it gives structure to something that can often feel very unstructured. What do I do next? What color should I use? Which, where should I go with this, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the part that I think is really fun is that you just, it's almost like creating art without thinking. Somebody else is doing the thinking for you because there's a set rhythm of how it's supposed to be. Okay, and then back to A. Oh yeah, I like those two together. And then we go to uh, C again, which is here. Talking and doing is hard. I'm losing track of my, where I'm supposed to be here. I'm getting back on track. Okay, there we go. And then we finish off with some C once more. So, so, no, did I already do that? Sorry, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, A, C. Ah, now we get to the D. So the D is metallic. So I have two kinds of metallic or two brands. I have this, check this out. These are Rembrandt and they have interference. So they're really meant to go on black. And what I discovered is they're much better on black. Oops. Because they're interference. So I ended up um, not liking these as much as these ones, which are the Sakura creative art colors. There's some neons and some metallics. And so I'm going to go ahead and take some, just going to throw some water on here to kind of get this activated. And I'm going to throw a little bit of D in here. D, 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 D. D, 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 D. Okay. And now that I've thrown the D in here, the next trick that um, the author suggests, uh, and I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, Kateri, I'm thinking. Um, is she says, just put some of the sparkle in kind of randomly or even between lines to kind of bridge what's happening. So sparkle, 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 a little bit of sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. Some little thin sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. And then, of course, you can do anything you want. I mean, I like to just throw a little bit of sparkle, sparkle, sparkle kind of everywhere. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and do the last part of this, which is you're supposed to take a pencil. Um, water soluble pencil is preferred, but any pencil is fine and sort of draw into it. So I forgot my pencil. So give me one second. And I am going to take, uh, I'll take a water soluble pencil. What have I got? This is a nice color. And then she says basically to create some, you know, lines that run horizontally. And you can be as aggressive as you want with that. I like that I end up dragging some watercolor sort of with the pencil. And then she says to also create some vertical lines. So you can make the vertical line sort of any way that you want running through here. 
But again, the nice thing about nice paper is that it holds up and takes a beating. So if you want to, you know, come through here, it's pretty easy. I'm not worried about going through anything wet or anything, you know, happening or anything like that. So it's nice to use that quality supplies. Okay. So normally you would wait until this dries and then you would take off the tape and the taking off the tape is really the magical part because that's how you end up with this somehow, right? Which is really kind of cool, I think. Um, it doesn't look quite as cool with the tape on it. So I'm going to take the tape off, even though you're supposed to wait till it dries. Maybe I will throw a heat gun. By the way, technically you're not really supposed to use a heat gun on watercolor because it does change the way that it dries. It doesn't pool as nicely. The colors don't mix the way that they normally do. But I'm just going to throw this heat gun at it to make it a little bit more dry so we won't have quite as much bleeding when I pull off the tape. Otherwise, it'll bleed into the edges. So while I'm doing this exciting drying and you're literally watching paint dry, um, I do want to mention that if you want to become a monthly art member over on my classroom site, you can do that. And it starts at $5.99 a month. We do lots of fun live streams if you enjoy my teaching and my style of um you know, uh, breaking things down, you might really enjoy that. You can also now hit the join button to become a part of Scan and Cut Club. That's right under this video if you're on a computer. If you're on uh, mobile, of course, um, you have to actually hit, uh, you have to actually do it on a computer. They won't let you do it from mobile for some reason, but that's um, a great if you're a Scan and Cut uh, owner. And of course, we can connect on Instagram or you can find me as Balls Resigns and I post tons and tons of art related content and frankly, a lot of baby <laughs> mom related content too because I just can't help myself. Okay, this looks like it's going to be plenty dry enough to go ahead and pull that off. So let's go ahead and do it. I do want to mention also that I do have a new art class that's starting October 1st, and there is going to be a 20% off discount code in my weekly newsletter. So if you want that discount code, be sure to sign up for the uh, Friday newsletter, and you'll get that 20% off code on Friday. Okay, so I'm just pulling the tape off now. And I love pulling the tape off. It is super magical. It just feels like the painting is finally complete when you get that tape off. And I should mention that I'm using Blick Artist Tape which is similar to painter's tape and it, it just comes off pretty cleanly and easily. Okay, so let's see, what do you think? I think it's just a really, really cool way of doing a painting without you really having to think about it. You know what I mean? So it's anyway, this was my favorite exercise from the book. I hope that you like it too. Uh, I do appreciate, by the way, Sherry, thank you for saying that the membership's worth every penny. I appreciate that so much. And yes, Laura, the memberships all come with singing too, as you well know. Uh, and yeah, the content is awesome. I think so too. So um, Ellen's asking what the new class is. So um, this is a, it's a, it's for print Inktober, which if you don't know, Inktober is an annual challenge where you're supposed to do an ink drawing um, every day in October. And so I sort of twisted it a little bit in 2018 and said, instead of drawing ink, let's use printing ink or stamping ink. And print Inktober is about taking your stamps out. And so I'm running the challenge. It's totally free to join the challenge. There's absolutely nothing that you have to do except say, hey, I want to stamp things and post your things with the print Inktober um, hashtag. It's a great challenge to really get your creative juices flowing. So I have a class going on uh, with it, which is going to be five hour long lessons that launch each Friday in October. October. So I think it's fun and it's $45. So very reasonable. So I hope you will uh, join me for that because I think it's going to be exciting. Um, so yeah, Carve December will happen again. We're not having a class again this year. I'm thinking that I'm going to do every other year for the class. I think it's a lot uh, otherwise, but yeah, definitely Carve December. If you want to carve stamps and go in the great thing, one of the great things, the difference between printing Tober 
and carve December is for printing Tober. You can use your foam stamps. You can use stamps that you bought. You can use wood stamps. You can use anything as opposed to carve December where you have to actively like make the stamps. So that's great. And Jana, yeah, thanks. I'm glad that you're a super learner member and that you appreciate it because I appreciate you. Thanks so much. So uh, Kristen said, or Kirsten, I apologize, says, how do you sign up for your newsletter? So you just have to go to this URL, which is bit.ly slash weekly balzer with a capital W and a capital B. You can also, if you just go to juliebalzer.com, there's a button that says sign up for the newsletter. And I think even in the description of this video, there is also a link to click. I've tried to make it easy for you to do all of that. Uh, and yeah, the gel plate of Palooza. Uh, that's another way that you could actually also think of printing Tober because of course you can print with your gelatin plate too. So another cool way to do it. So I hope you guys enjoy this. I mean, my final analysis is super fun. I think it's a, like, like I said, it's a little foofy lala for me, but her heart and my heart, I feel like speak to each other. Um, because again, she's so about like being free and letting go of your inner critic and not like, you know, being mad at yourself and all these things that I so agree with and so endorse. And I also think a lot of the exercises in here are super fun. She's obviously very knowledgeable about watercolor, but what I love is she doesn't try to teach you the technical things about this is called wet and wet. Now we will make washes down the side. And you know, I've been guilty of doing that too as a teacher. This is a really fun way to learn watercolor. So if you're kind of watercolor curious, I think this is a good book to get started with. That's my kind of final analysis of it. And it sounds like from the comments from the people who have also dived in that you guys also feel that way about it, which is true. Um, so Ellen, thanks so much for the super sticker. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you as always. And thank you so much everyone who has left comments and said such nice things. This is really fun for me. I got an email yesterday from someone said, are you going to keep doing the book club? And I said, yes, I'm going to keep doing the book club as long as it's fun for me. And it is super fun for me. So let's talk about the next book and Jana. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you love the newsletter and the blog post that I annoy you every day in your email. Uh, okay, so the next book that we are gonna be doing is this one. It's called How to Paint Abstracts. And it's another library book. Um, and I, let me just put up that the next um, book club is October 13th. It's gonna be at 2 p.m. Um, and we're going to be discussing the book Pocket Art Guides, How to Paint Abstracts. I have your Amazon link for you there. I think I also put it in the description or I will when this is over um, so that you can go ahead and grab this book if you're interested or you can check it out from your library. But that's a month. So um, there's some things that look good in this book to me. Um, for instance, geometric synthesis and fragmentation. Right. Doesn't that look like fun? So I think there'll be some fun stuff in here. The interesting thing is that there isn't really an author on this. It's just put out by Barons without a uh, author listed. So I don't know if it's compilation of things from like several books that they've published or what. They do have some profiles of artists in here as well. So we're going to see how that is. I don't know if anybody has this book or has read it and has any opinions about it. Um, but, uh, oh, good. Ellen says she thinks she already has this book. Oh, Teresa, thank you. She says she opens the blog post emails first thing every day. I like to think that you and I have a cup of coffee in the morning. That's awesome to hear. So thank you all for being here. This really works because you leave comments because you make it so much fun for me. And I hope you'll remember that whatever the book is, you can make it work for you. You just have to figure out what you like about it and sort of, you know, filter it through your you filter until it's a hundred percent you. So I'll see you all around next time. Thanks so much. Bye.